So let's go through some last minute revision for your paper two exam. Just briefly, here are some of the topics that we will be covering. You can obviously skip ahead and focus on the ones that you might want to remind yourself of. So starting off with error intervals, we've got two types of this question. The first one is a number m is rounded to one decimal place. The result is 9.4. Complete the error interval for m. So whenever you can see your error interval question has been rounded, it doesn't matter if it's one decimal place or to the nearest 50 meters or whatever it is, if it's been rounded, it's exactly the same concept as upper and lower bounds. So you just need to write something a little bit less and a little bit more. So for this one, it could have been as small as 9.35 and it could be as big as 9.45. Now with error intervals, they do include the inequality symbols. Obviously it's not equal to 9.45 because I do realize that would round up to 9.5. It's just saying anything slightly less. So that accounts for the option of it being 9.4499999 to infinity, right? That accounts for it. You don't need to write this. So a little bit less, a little bit more. Same as upper and lower bounds. The scenario where it's not the same as upper and lower bounds is something like this. So Martin truncates the number n to one digit. The result is seven. Write down the error interval for n. So the word truncate means that Martin looked at his number and after one digit, he just ignored the rest. He didn't round up, he didn't round down, he just literally ignored everything that came after the first digit. So this isn't the same as upper and lower bounds. In this particular case, it means that seven would have been the smallest value that his number could have been. It 100% started with a seven, he just happened to ignore everything else that came after it. So if you've got the scenario with truncating, you just copy the same number for the smallest value. Now the biggest value is technically eight. Obviously it can't be eight, but because of this inequality symbol, we're just saying anything slightly less than eight. So that could have been 7.999. Again, this kind of 999 to infinity scenario. It accounts for that, doesn't it? because we know that there was definitely a seven, we just don't know what came after the seven, if anything. So the smallest is seven or 7.0, I guess. And the biggest is technically eight, but that's accounting for the 7.99999 recurring. The next topic is obviously then gonna be compound interest and you do have the formula on your formula sheet if you need it. So Louise invests X pounds in better investments for three years. Sadiq invests X pounds in County Bank for three years. So they both invest the same amount of money and both for three years. You can see that we've got better investments as compound interest for 2.5% per annum, so for every year. County Bank, however, is 2% compound interest for the first two years, but after that it changes to 3.5% for every other year following. So at the end of three years, the value of Louise's investment is £344,605. Work out the value of Sadiq's investment at the end of three years. So let's focus first on Louise. Let's set up her equation. She took her principal amount or her initial amount, which was X, multiplied it by one plus the 2.5% compound interest. So make that into a decimal, divide by 100, and then to the power of the time, which was three years. Now we actually have the answer. That's the 344,605 pounds. So all I need to do is just rearrange this to find X. So as you can see, all I would need to do is just divide everything by this bracket, wouldn't I? To rearrange that equation. And that gives me 320,000 pounds, which seems like a reasonable number, doesn't it? It's not got loads of decimals. So X is 320,000 pounds. So we're done with Louise now. We can almost tick that off. Now we can look at Sadiq because Sadiq also invested the same 320,000 pounds, but into County Bank. So for Sadiq, we just need to work it out as normal. You take your principal amount, which was the 320,000 pounds, multiply it by one plus the compound interest, which is 2% over 100. However, only for two years though. If you want to type it in straight to the calculator in a decimal format as 1.02 to the power of two, that's also fine. You don't have to write it literally as I'm doing. I'm just copying the formula sheet so that you know kind of how to apply it. So after two years, Sadiq has £332,929. But we still have one more year left. So this is now going to be our new principal amount, your starting amount. That's 
Now here, times by 1 plus the different interest rate, 3.5 over 100, technically to the power of one year, but obviously that makes kind of no difference, does it? So you don't really need to write that. And that gives you £344,580.48. I tend to just leave the decimal because I feel like it's only two decimal places, which works in the case of money anyway, doesn't it? So I would just leave it like that. And that's the value of Sadiq's investment at the end of three years. We've now got a question on recognizing graphs, matching them up with their equation. So in the table below, match each equation with the letter of its graph. So we've got the sine graph. Let's first of all identify which ones are trigonometric graphs in the first place. We've got this one here is a trig graph. And then we've also got D is a trig graph. None of the rest are trigonometric graphs. So out of these two, though, we need to know even more specifically which is the sine graph. Now, the sine graph always starts at zero, zero. And the cos graph looks the same, but it starts at 1. So this one is obviously the cos graph. This one is the sine graph, so that would be C. Then the next one is a cubic graph. Which ones look like cubic graphs? Well, luckily, there's only one that looks like a cubic graph, isn't there, here? This one is a cubic graph. If it's negative, it can look like that. So that would be F. We've then got our exponential graph. Now, here we have two graphs that look like exponential graphs. We've got A and we've got i. But which one is actually 2 to the power of x? Well, the difference between these two is not necessarily positive or negative. What it is, this one, which is where k is greater than 1, and this one where k is actually between 0 and 1, it would actually get smaller. So the one we want is a, because our 2 is obviously bigger than 1. Lastly, we've got reciprocal. Again, we've got two reciprocal graphs here. We've got b, and we've got h. For B and H, in this case, the difference is whether it's a negative reciprocal or whether it's a positive reciprocal graph. Because 4 is positive, it's going to be H. Now, the last two are both different types of quadratic graphs, X squared. This one is a negative X squared. And this one, because it's being dragged down, would probably be X squared minus, I don't know, some kind of number. It's been translated down. So those are pretty much the majority of the graphs you need to recognise. Obviously, also don't forget the tan graph too. Question 12. OAB is a sector of a circle with centre O and radius 7 centimetres. The area of the sector is 40 centimetres squared. Calculate the perimeter of the sector. So for the perimeter, we would obviously need to have 7 plus 7 plus the arc length. Now for the arc length, we would need our formula which is the whole circumference, so let's say 2 pi r. You can also use pi times diameter, that's fine. Times by the angle over 360. So now you can see what the problem is. We do know the radius, but we don't know this angle. So that's why they've given us the area. Now, if we set up the formula for the area of a sector, very similar. So obviously, instead of the circumference, we're now using the whole area, pi r squared, times by which portion of the whole circle I want, so the angle. Now, because I know that the area is actually 40 centimetres squared, I also know the radius, which is 7, so 7 squared. Do you see how now the only thing missing is my angle, which is what I want to then find the arc length? So let's rearrange this. We've got here 49 pi angle, or theta in other words. You can use x if you prefer for this to represent the angle, is equal to 40. What you can do, because it is a calculated test, you can just divide 40 by this whole fraction, or you can do it in different steps, it's up to you. To save time, I'm just going to divide it by the whole fraction. And it's obviously given me a decimal, 93.54 degrees is my angle. Because it's not the end of the question, I am going to keep my decimal answer in my calculator, but I now know the angle. So we can go straight and put it into the arc length formula. So that would be 2 times pi times the radius, which is 7 times by the angle 93.54 over 360. And I just need to type that straight in. So I'm going to keep this answer here, use my answer button. So for the arc length, I get, let's say, 11.43 centimetres. Now, don't forget, though, that the whole thing was the perimeter, wasn't it? So the perimeter would be the arc length plus the other two sides, which are both a radius. Now this is my final answer. So they want it correct to three significant figures, so I can finally round it. That would be 25.4. Moving on from area, we now have volume of a prism. 
So we've got a diagram shows a prism. The cross section of the prism it has exactly one line of symmetry. Work out the volume of the prism. The area of the cross section multiplied by the length. So the cross section in this case is obviously referring to this bit here. So it is a compound shape. I do need to find the area of both. The area of the rectangle is obviously the easiest thing to start with. Length times width, so 12 times 10, which is obviously 120 centimeter squared. Then the area of the triangle. Now that one's a little bit trickier because we need base times height over two. The base, as you can see, is 10 because it's the same as this one down here. But we don't know the height over two. So I need to find the height. I obviously want the perpendicular height, which is why they've told us that this shape has one line of symmetry. It's saying that these are isosceles triangles, so they're identical on each side. Obviously, I've got here a right angle triangle. They've told me that I've got 40 degrees, and technically, this side here would be five because it's exactly half, isn't it? So I can use normal trig. I want to know the opposite, which is the height, and I've got the adjacent, which is the five. So I'm going to be using tan. So I get my formula triangle because I'm looking for the opposite. Cross that one out. So it tells me to find the height of the triangle, I need to do tan, obviously of the angle 40, multiplied by the adjacent, which was five, which gives me 4.195 dot dot dot. So that's now the height. So come back to my actual formula. Now I can work out the area of the triangle as a whole. 20.977 dot dot dot. So the whole area, the whole cross section is both of these added together, the whole of the yellow bit, which gives me 140.977. So the volume would be 140.977, which is my total cross section, area of the cross section, multiplied by length 2819.55. Now I want to round it to three significant figures, which would be 2820 centimeters squared. Moving on to iteration, so show that the equation x cubed plus 7x minus 5 equals 0 has a solution between x is 0 and x is 1. For two marks, all you need to remember is sub in both values, whichever values they give you. So I tend to write when x is 0. If I sub that in, that's 0 cubed. I know it seems kind of pointless to write it, but they want the working out, so just write it. That obviously gives you minus 5, doesn't it? Then do the same for whatever other value they've given you, which is 1 for this one. 1 cubed plus 7 times 1, so that's 8, minus 5, that would give us 3. So what you're looking for is if it equals to 0 here, you're looking for a number that would be less than 0 and a number that would be above 0. In this case, obviously, that means that there would be a sign change because negative, positive, below 0, above 0. So this is one mark. You then have to write a conclusion. Sign change, or symbol change, positive, negative. Therefore, and then you copy this bit of the sentence, right? Solution between x is 0 and x is 1. And that would give you two marks. Part b is then show that the equation x cubed plus 7x minus 5 equals 0 can be arranged to give x is equal to 5 over x squared plus 7. They just want you to look at both and see if you can figure out the steps that they took to go from here to here. So I can see the first thing is they've obviously moved the 5 across, isn't it? Let's do that first. They've obviously moved the 5 by adding it. They've obviously left an x behind, so I think they've factorised it out, factorised out an x, and left themselves with a bracket of x squared plus 7. So then you can see they've obviously just divided by that bracket, and there you are. Starting with x, 0 is 1. Use the iteration formula, x, m plus 1, 5 divided by the previous answer squared plus 7 three times to find an estimate for the solution of x cubed plus 7x minus 5 equals 0. This is how I would set up my calculator. So whatever their starting value is, you put that into your calculator, press equals. Now it's saved in the answer button, isn't it? Then type in the formula. Wherever it says xn here, you put answer. Don't forget that in this case they have squared it and then they've added 7. So that's my formula, isn't it, basically? Now that I've set it up like this, all I need to do is press equals three times. So if I press it once, it will give me the value for x1, so 0 0.625. Now for x2, I won't copy the same thing. So I just need to press equals again. And I've got 0 0.6765 dot dot dot. I'd probably just write down a load of decimals, if not all of them. And then lastly, for x3, just do it again. Press equals once more. We've got 0 0.67044 dot 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 dot. 
Now, because this one I have asked for an estimate for one solution, you would give your final answer. So for me, because they haven't told us how to round it, I am just going to write all of them just in case. Question 21, slightly more complicated now. We've got upper and lower bounds. So the time period t seconds of a single pendulum of length L is given by the formula, which you can see there. KT uses a simple pendulum in an experiment to find an estimate for the value of G. Here are her results. We've got L as 52.0, correct to three significant figures, and T is 1.45, correct to three significant figures. Work out the upper bound and the lower bound of the value of G. The first thing to really pick up on here is they want the value of G. G is not currently the subject of the formula. So firstly, I need to rearrange this. So I'm going to do that really quickly because that's not really the point of the question. Now let's have a look at it. We want to know the upper and the lower bound for the values of G. So because we've got a divide scenario, you're going to have to pick between a mixture of upper and lower bounds for L and T. So first of all, work out the upper and lower bounds, both of them for L and T. So for L, the upper bound is actually 52.05, not 52.5. The lower bound is therefore 51.95. And then T, this one I think is probably a little bit more straightforward. We just chuck a 5 on the end. Lower bound, 1.445. Let's do the upper bound of G. To get the biggest possible answer, I need to do, obviously, 4 times pi squared anyway, times by the biggest possible numerator. That would create the biggest possible numerator, wouldn't it? And divide it by the smallest possible denominator. Obviously, don't forget that that is squared as well. Don't forget the actual formula at the same time. Now, also don't forget that they have said to use pi as 3.14, so I will do that. Although they don't penalise you if you forget. So I get 984.36778. And then for the lower bound of G, it's basically the opposite, isn't it? I want the smallest possible numerator divided by the biggest possible denominator, which is 969.018. So just give your answers here. I just normally write a few decimal places at least if they haven't specified how many. Our last topic is obviously going to be sine rule, cosine rule, trigonometric area of a triangle. So we've got ABC and ADC are triangles. The area of triangle ADC, so the bottom one, is 56 metres squared. Work out the length of AB. So the area of a triangle, using the trigonometric format, because we don't have perpendicular heights or anything, is a half AB, so that would be 11, times by this side we don't know. So I'm just going to call it CD, sine of the angle between them, which is 105. Now, actually, I do know that that equals 56, so I'll put that in as well. I might as well rearrange the equation. So if you want, you can obviously divide by everything at once. So that leaves me with just CD, doesn't it? So I get 10.54-ish, 10.54 for the side CD. Normally, when you've got two triangles stuck together, you always find the side that joins them. So we're going to find AC. Now, looking at that, I've got three sides, including obviously the one I want to find, plus an angle. That's obviously going to be cosine rule. You can obviously change the angles and the sides to match the formula sheet. So this would be side A. This, we'll call that one C because it's opposite C anyway, and that one can be B. Then just sub it to your cosine rule. So type that all in. Don't forget, though, that, that is the squared version. So we also need to square root the answer. So we've got 17.09 for AC. Lastly, I'm now looking at triangle ABC. I want to find AB. I know two sides and two angles. Do they match as opposites? Yep, that can be side B. And the one I want can be side C. So perfect. Now I can use sine rule. Because I'm looking for a side, I will obviously put that at the top and the angles in the denominator. So we've got 17.09 over sine 118. Obviously, just remember to rearrange it to get AB as your subject and then type it into the calculator. Still going to use my answer button for the 17, which gives me 14.385 and we want it to one decimal place, so 14.4. So that was everything for your last minute revision for paper two. Best of luck for your exam. I really hope it goes well. And then we will be back for paper three, where we can at least then slightly narrow down our revision a little bit more once we know what's already come up in paper one and paper two. So thanks for watching this video. If you found it helpful, make sure to like and subscribe and join me for your last week of maths revision before paper three.